I was born and brought up in a family of lawyers and married into one. So becoming a lawyer was perhaps obvious. But someone along the way told me something about lawyers. They said lawyers are like rhinos. Thick-skinned, short-sighted, and always ready to charge. Well, that made me change my mind, and I thought academics would be a better bet for me. So I teach law at the law school at the university now. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to talk to you today about justice, about leadership, and about people who have displayed exemplary courage and leadership in the legal field. India got independent in 1947. The path of freedom has been very tough. We have struggled, we have endeavored, and we have exerted in our attempt to make India a free democracy. In fact, it is still work in progress for us. There is a lesson here that the longing for freedom and human dignity is not just Indian. It is universal and it beats in every heart. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution of India and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every Indian was to fall heir. The note was a promise to guarantee to every person in India the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The exalted fundamental rights enshrined in the Constitution of India were to be guaranteed to every child and every man in this country. Justice is and was our fundamental right. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a fact that the institution is always greater than the men than the men who run it at any given time. However, there are some occasions when the deeds of certain individuals make the institution even greater. The brave individual judge who carves a path of truth, honesty, and fearlessness infects the system with it. We are proud to be a part of a nation that has produced lawyers and judges who have withstood the pressures and led the country to a better democracy. I want to share the example of Justice Bijan Kumar Mukherjee, who sat as a judge of the Supreme Court when it was inaugurated on 26th of January 1950. He was a great judge, not only because he was erudite and delivered landmark judgments, but because he established a glorious tradition of independence. Pandit Nehru, the Prime Minister at that time, made him an offer. The offer was to take over as the next Chief Justice of India. To do this, Justice Mukherjee would have had to supersede, overtake a judge senior to him. He firmly declined Pandit Nehru's offer. He said, I would rather resign than accept your offer. Such was the character of this great judge. Justice B. R. Krishnayar, another great judge. He was fearless, he was independent. The case before him, a very difficult one. The Prime Minister of India at that time had been charged with having committed corrupt practices during elections. And the High Court had ordered that the Prime Minister, because of this charge, had forfeited the right to sit in the Parliament and could no longer attend the sessions of the Parliament. The Prime Minister appealed to the Supreme Court. The judge was Justice Ayer. Despite the pressures and the pleadings of the government, Justice Ayer did not relent. Indeed, he never bothered for any consequences and always did and stood for what was right. The true test of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, 
but where he stands in times of challenge and controversy. I have another story to tell you. It is the story of the constitution of India and its people. Our forefathers had fought for the freedom of this country and they gave to us the constitution of India. They gave to us the cherished fundamental freedoms and rights of the people of this country. And they allowed the parliament to amend and modify the constitution of India. But the parliament got greedy. It wanted more power. It wanted the power to also modify, amend and take away the soul of this constitution, the fundamental freedoms of the people of this country. Now the constitution was merely a book. How would it defend itself? But it had a guardian, it had a protector, the judiciary. And the judiciary stood firm. It defended the defenseless constitution and the fundamental rights of the people of this land. It ruled that the parliament could amend, change, modify every provision in the constitution. But in the exercise of this power, it could not damage the very heart and soul of the constitution of India that were the fundamental freedoms of this people, of the people. Another incident was during the internal emergency in 1976. Hundreds of people had been detained and put behind bars. The question before the Supreme Court was, could these people be given the right to bail in the exercise of their fundamental right to life and personal liberty? In other words, did the people of India have the right to life and personal liberty during the time of emergency? Everyone said no. Justice Khanna dissented. He said no. This is the most important, the most fundamental of all rights. The right to life and personal liberty is not ours to give or take away from the people. It inheres in the people of this land because they are human beings. That was his character. Indeed, the right to life and personal liberty is the most sacrosanct. And the contribution of the Indian judiciary towards the protection of this right of personal liberty is perhaps the most important narrative in our democracy. The judiciary has made access to justice easier. It evolved the concept of a public interest litigation, wherein any member of the public can approach the court for relief against a wrong action of the government, which affects the public at large. And through the public interest litigations, the Supreme Court and the Indian judiciary have granted relief to the environment of this country, to its forests, to its rivers, to its children and its, to its women. The structure of Indian society is very unique. Perhaps we need to make an extra effort to overcome the lacunas. And the judiciary has taken the step in doing that. Take the case of women. The judiciary has worked and protected and upheld the rights of women. It has worked where it has granted relief to women in cases of dowry, in cases of female feticide, in cases of honor killings, in cases of violence, in cases of sexual harassment, and what else. The objective has always been justice. Some of the best poetry was written by Milton. He was blind. Some of the best music was composed by Beethoven. He was deaf. One of the greatest presidents was Franklin D. Roosevelt. He served from a wheelchair. The point is that all these men were men of character. And that is all that you need for justice. And that is the legacy of the Indian judiciary. Justice 
is the first promise of the Indian constitution. Yet, it is the last item in the union budget. The constitution provides for an independent judiciary. Yet, it is dependent on the executive for its finances. Still, has the judiciary not performed and upheld the promise of justice? Has it not protected and worked for the rights of the people of this country? Has it not acted against the arbitrariness of the government? Let me tell you, it has withstood the onslaught against the fundamental rights of the people. It has protected the rights of children. It has protected the environment from degradation. It has promoted good governance. It has promoted justice. Friends, the Supreme Court is the victim and not the author of the innumerable inept laws in our country. The appointment of judges today is in the dock awaiting a nod from the executive. And in this situation, is it not irrational to blame the judiciary alone for the mountain of pending cases? The judiciary has followed and stood for the path of fearless justice, equality, and human dignity. And I share this with you today because it is for the present generation to know the legacy of our past, our glory, our tradition, and the men who made it possible to carry the banner forward. Thank you all. Thank you for listening.